the shatter of that skin. That is the magic of this dish. From the magic of traditional Peking duck to the creamy crunch of a dish born here in the U.S. to the spice and sizzle of kebabs. Over the past few weeks, our own Gerald Tan has been taking us on quite a culinary journey through our series, Soul Food. And after weeks of making us all hungry, Gerald joins us now to give us some insight into this series. So, Gerald, um, what inspired this journey into Chinese-American food? Okay, so... I really think that the inspiration comes from my own journey uh, in this country. You know, when I moved here as a teenager, I was introduced to, well, Chinese food, and I thought, great, a taste from home. And I didn't recognize any of it. And I thought to myself, one, this tastes really foreign, but two, this tastes really good. And so my favorite dish was General Tso's chicken, of course. Of course. But, you know, for me, the thing was, it was really interesting, because as I continued to travel the world, and as I grew up, I realized that you know, there's Chinese cuisine everywhere, but it's so different. And to me, it was these, the diaspora and the descendants, you know, um, either preserving, adapting, or inventing new dishes, new techniques, oftentimes all three at once, right? Um, and so it's just this real interesting resilience, creativity. Um, and so when I uh, moved back here, I thought to myself, you know what, it's time to explore some of these stories, to see the journeys they've taken, uh, and to talk about the stories of, you know, a new world, but through the lens of food. And so I remember General Tso's chicken. I think about home cooking, so soul food was born. You know, and it's really a mix because a lot of Americans think this is their first foray into foreign food. And so it's a, a little bit of an introduction. So in talking to all these different chefs, did you find any commonalities among them? Did you share any common threads with them? Oh, oh, I mean, well, for me, I think it's always quite impressive. The, the common thread for any chef, really, is the passion, right? They all came from, um, they came into food very differently. One was pretty much born in the kitchens of his father's restaurant. Another was a hairdresser who came into the United States and realized, I want a new life and, you know, open a restaurant. Another was an engineer with a master's degree and then decided he woke up one day and kind of said, actually, my true love is food. So they came into food really differently, right? But they have this passion. But that passion is then really built upon by sheer hard work. You know, to own a restaurant means hours and hours, you know, like that you spend in the kitchen, uh, just preparing and then cooking. But there's this extra element, and all three of them mention it in some form or another, of how difficult it is to compete owning a Chinese restaurant in this country because of the perception that Chinese food should be cheap. It should be more affordable. It's kind of the quick and dirty, don't say it's dirty food, but you know that this is what people think of. It's late night or it's takeout. And so to have to shatter that perception, you know, of we are still putting a lot of hours to make the food that you have but they're competing. And so they kind of say, you know, you go to an Italian restaurant and people wouldn't complain if they pay $30, $35 for a plate of pasta, but people would scream you charge, try to charge $20 for a plate of noodles. Why? So it's actually really interesting to hear the threats of the kind of difficulties they've had to face, you know, in operating a Chinese restaurant in this country. And, and some Chinese restaurants saw, um, you know, took a hit this year, oh, yeah. uh, taking this on a more serious note, surviving the pandemic, mm. but also you've seen a rise in anti-Asian hate mm. across the country. Some restaurants had to shut down, totally. some business owners and chefs were threatened oh, yeah. or uh, really beat up. Yeah. yeah. And so Tim Ma, one of the chefs you spoke to, had a really interesting message and a philanthropy that he wanted to help other people. I want to take a listen to one of his sound bites and get your reaction on sure. the other end. When we saw the events start happening um, this year during the pandemic, it made me think of, A, it looked like my parents, or it looked like my grandparents. A lot of the targets were businesses. We had a platform that we could speak on, and it would feel irresponsible if we didn't use it. And so that was actually the driving impetus for us to start the nonprofit. So were their businesses affected? Did they have to shut down? Were they impacted mm. um, by anyone? Well, you know, the pandemic definitely came up in all these places I visited and the subject of AAPI hate. And all three that I spoke to for this series were really lucky, they said, you know, that uh, they did not face any discrimination 
per se. Uh, but instead, what they felt was just this overwhelming support from their customer base who kind of said, we know what you're going through. We know the pandemic's been hard for restaurants. We know it's been particularly hard for you know, the Asian community in the United States because of you know, previous administration that kept trying to link you know, the people to the pandemic. And so they went into overdrive trying to support them to the business. That's not to say that the businesses didn't have a hard time because, you know, so many did. But in this case, they were really lucky um, that they did not personally, uh, you know, get targeted uh, in these attacks. I know with Tim Ma, you uh, got a couple of tips. I mean, you're a chef. Ah. I mean, you cook, you're a foodie. <laughs> I love um, to eat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you're right there with these guys. They put you to work. Anything that you took away from this that you're going to, like, put away in your own repertoire of skills? Ooh, okay, so I love a Thanksgiving turkey, and I can't tell you how many turkeys I've carved. I've never carved a duck before, so I was just handed this peeking duck, and I said, all right, here goes nothing. Number one, it is hot. I'm, you, know, you don't really think about just this bird, this heavy, hot bird in your hand, so trying to slice and shatter that skin, that was one. Um, yeah, but it's... it's Breaking through the skin would be, I mean, very intimidating for me. <laughs> well, you know, I kind of figure you might, you have to try, you know, you have to do it your first time, right? Um, but then, okay, so I um, was so intrigued by crab rangoons because this is truly an American invented dish. And he taught me because the first thing I ate it, and I said, this is just so crunchy. And I couldn't figure out how he got that crunch. And he says, that's the secret. So if you want to do anything, wontons, spring rolls, he goes, you need that extra layer. Ah, you can see it. You need this extra layer of skin because the, that initial layer will absorb all the liquid. And so the outer one, when it touches the hot oil, it really crisps up. And so that is something that is going right into my toolkit, and I'm trying, but it's a lot of work. I'm <laughs> just warning you. <laughs> well, more so full to come. Uh, Gerald, thank, thank you so much. We cannot wait for your next episode. Thank you very much.